attention, please. Very good. How are you all doing today? Good. Excellent, excellent. We're going to begin this panel forum. We'd like to thank every senior that came to school today, as you should come every day. And we are hoping that you all will be able to um, get something from this forum. We hope that the, the panelists that we have will be able to answer your questions. We hope that it will be thought provoking and that you will leave here different than when you came. So at this uh, time, we're going to have um, our president of Alpha Kappa Alpha Sorority, who put this event on, and it was in partnership with the mayor's office. We were also in partnership with Greenhouse Fellowship, The Circle, and TAG Incorporated. So I'd like to say thank you to all our partners, and we hope that you enjoy this. My name is Valerie Kim Davis. I am the scholarship chairperson for Ada Kappa Omega Chapter of Alpha Kappa Alpha Sorority Incorporated. We have had these applications in the guidance office, and I'm hoping that you all have filled them out. Seniors who have good GPAs, you have filled them out and got them in. If not, we're going to extend it a little bit more, so you need to be mindful of that. Um, Ms. Peyton, can you come forward so that you can welcome our students and our guests at this time? Excellent, excellent. Great. Um, I'm excited today because uh, we really are in the, the midst of something not only just exciting, uh, but in the birthing stage in regards to when we talk about on the cuff of being grown. Uh, with that being said, I, I just cannot delay it any further in regards to bringing up our panel. But to let you know, she already introduced you. I am a president of Ada Kappa Omega, which is a graduate chapter of Alpha Kappa Alpha Sorority Incorporated, uh, located within East Chicago and Hammond, Indiana. And so it is our pleasure to be able to not only welcome you, but to also welcome you into being grown as well too. So with that being said, as I introduce uh, each speaker today, if you could please join me at the table and, and take a seat, that'd be greatly appreciated. And then for my audience, if you could just hold off on that round of applause until they all get seated. Excellent. All right. Without further ado, we're going to have Pastor Juan Bonilla come to the floor. Thank you. I did say to the end, to the end, Pastor Kelly Williams. We have Commander Maldonado. Officer T. Edwards. Officer W. Eskew. K. Robertson. Oh, Roberson, thank you. Keon Brown. Bishop Tavis Grant. Jada Glasper. Mayor Anthony Copeland. The Honorable Bernard Carter, Lake County Prosecutor. And from the 5th District, Councilman Rosendo Cuevas. In addition, we have our moderators for today, and that is Mr. Denzel Smith and Ms. Latanya Hicks. Okay. We also have Mr. Kelvin Bride from TAG. Before we get started, so now we have a round of applause. The game changers. These are our game changers. And game changers, we welcome you to sit at the table of brotherhood. Let us begin. And we're going to ask uh, Pastor Juan Vanilla to come forth with prayer. Honey, 
yet parked in the front entrance, your car must be moved. Now, again, a two-door silver Pontiac parked in front of the school's front entrance. You must move your car now. Testing. Okay. Good afternoon. I would like to please uh, bow your heads as we pray this afternoon. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, we come before you in the name of Jesus Christ, your Son. We thank you for this honor, dear God, that you give us, Lord, and this privilege you give us to be here today. Lord, I just ask for your blessing upon each and every one of us, Lord, those who are participating, those who are listening, Lord. And I ask that everything that is done here, Lord, be through your guidance. And Lord, above all things, that you receive the honor and the glory. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. What you see abroad could happen here in East Chicago, but we decree and declare it shall not. Declaring is to make a statement, to say it with forthright and conviction. What do you declare? As officers of the community, they take an oath and they decree and declare they, they shall protect and serve. What do you declare? Some of you have declared that black life matters, brown life matters. Should there be a division, a chasm, a gulf in between the two thoughts, the two schools of thoughts? No, this should not. We live with the spirit of fear. Every day when officers strap up and go out, they have intentions of going home. They have intentions of protecting and serving and to work in and for the community. It's called community policing. Are there good officers? Absolutely, and today we applaud them. We see several of them at this table. Some have high, high ranks, and some have mediocre ranks that are not at this table, and some have much intention to continue to climb and do well. We appreciate everything that our people in blue do for us. I say decree and declare is very important because there's life and death in the tongue. I need you as students to understand that the word is really cusp, on the cusp of being ground. But we made a play on that and said on the cup of being ground. Why? Because some of you all are right now making decisions that might be detrimental to your future. We need you to rethink that right here, right now, so that you will not be on the cuff, but on the cusp of doing great things to step into your destiny. We have a wonderful mayor, Mayor Anthony Copeland, who has dreams and visions for this city. You see that. He has decreed a thing and declared a thing, and so it is. Part of his vision includes you, myself, Denzel Smith, and Chief John Burbage had a chance to sit down in his office for over an hour, and you are definitely on his heart. And at the time we had the conversation, we didn't even know if he would be reelected. We felt he might be, but we didn't know for sure because the people had to speak. But whether he was elected or not, he made a commitment to you for this day, for this time, for this season, to conversate about this thing. I ask that you all open your hearts and minds to the panelists, the clergy that are on here, represent the pulse and the spiritual base of the community. We have lawmakers, prosecutors, we have a plethora of people. We have folks who have been through great trials and tribulations that are brave. Ms. Kay Roberson is here representing her son who's no longer here and his brother that you all know 
formerly your 2014 uh, class president, Keon Brown. Please open your heart and your mind to everyone that's involved here. Um, if I did not call your name or recognize your status, please forgive me, but you know what your purpose is at this table of brotherhood, um, and we welcome you. Let the dinner begin. Good afternoon. We're going to go ahead and get started with our questions. Panelists, um, for, your, um, for you all to know, some of these questions have come directly from the students. Some have been created um, by the partners for this program. So we want you all to um, answer these questions as honest as possible. We're going to start with um, Mayor Anthony Copeland. This is a brave thing that you are doing by participating in this dialogue. What motivated you to support and participate on this panel? remaining transparent in the light of hostility in the nation and many neighborhoods. Uh, when you came and saw me in my office, uh, yes. Uh, recently when you came uh, to my office and uh, you told me uh, the scope of what you wanted to do, and I can feel the sincerity and the compassion. Uh, Sometimes we may think there's everything is hunky dory in our community, um, and we really don't. Sometimes we may think we know how to use bill, but we really don't. Uh, Sometimes uh, you can look at the statistics, and I can tell you that crime has gone down for four consecutive years. But if you never hear from the person that something happens to, again. You can never feel the spirit of what's going on in your city. So uh, I just thought that the best way to do it was for me to open up first my heart, then open up my ears and listen to what is going on in the community, and then try to address it from there. Um, if anybody else would like to tell us some more information on that, on the panel, just raise your hand. Okay, so we're going to go on to the next question. This is for Commander Maldonado. Will we ever see black and white officers paired together or Latino and white officers together? Do you believe this will help the community and the new officers and citizens become acclimated with the changes on both sides? Uh, if, your, if your question is paired up, meaning as partners in, in vehicles, um, it's, it, in law enforcement, it's just more effective to have one officer in a car. Um, it has nothing to do with anything else aside from it's just it's more effective for us. We're, we allocate our resources a lot better that way. Um, a lot of it has to do with visibility. One officer can get it, it's it's better to have more vehicles out there. And we have the same number of officers. It covers more ground, more high visibility. Um, as far as the the, the racial mix up as far as Hispanics and, and African Americans and, and whites. Um, if, if you knew how close we were as far as the PD, um, it, it's, it's blue, it's not any type of racial colors there. So as far as those being paired up, none of us, no one in that department has a problem being paired up with any type of different or different racial group or ethnic group. Um, as far as the, the, for lack of a better word, the demographics and our PD, uh, we represent the city of East Chicago very, very well. Um, we recently, we've hired probably more Caucasians than um, African Americans or Hispanics. Um, but it's, there's, a, there's a different process now. It's, do we have a merit board? It's just a little bit different now. Um, we're, we're trying to, to reach out for more African Americans and more Hispanic police officers. We're, we're attempting that. Maybe something like this will open the door. It just seems for some reason that um, they, they don't want to become police officers, and I don't see I don't see why. I mean, it's the greatest job in the world. Um, but as far as the, the, the demographics we have, I think right now it's like 60 percent, 50 percent Hispanic, 40 percent Black, and the rest Caucasian. So we have a really good mixture of, of nationalities and ethnic groups in our police department. Um, and yes, I think that if if this is answers some of the questions, I think that that a police department should be uh, 
the same demographics or as close to it as we could get it to the community that it serves, no question about it. A lot of us here have been raised, well, I was born and raised in Chicago, I think both of us officers here, uh, Sergeant Juan Beltran. There's four of us at this panel, every one of us was born and raised in Chicago. So a lot of the officers that you see out there, uh, you may not recognize them, they're probably a little older than you, but they were born and raised in Chicago, so we are, we are getting a pool of people that live in East Chicago. For some reason, in the last few years, we haven't. Hopefully, that will change. Um, and yes, it, it's much better to, I, I believe, I think they agree with me, um, to police a community that you were born and raised in. Um, you have some critics who say, no, it shouldn't be that way because you know the people, you have friends, you have family. As far as we're concerned, it's, it's better that way because you can relate to the people much, much better at that level. Thank you. The next question is posed for any of the law enforcement that's here. What makes you stop a person for questioning when there clearly is no criminal activity? Is there dreadlocks, age, music type, urban clothes, the neighborhood they're walking in, their loudness, quietness? What is it? Uh, I guess I'll try to answer that one too. Um, We're, we're going to see things differently here as a, as a law enforcement agency uh, than, than you will. Um, you, when, when you see a, an officer stopping a, a car, um, you see the black, the black kid or the Hispanic kid, and you see a white officer stopping it. That's what you see. Um, and, and I don't know if you know the same perception is 80%, 90% of reality. So it becomes reality to you. And the first thing that comes to your mind is he's stopping it because he's black, or he's stopping it because, or she's stopping it because he's Hispanic or black. Um, and, and I can assure you, I can assure you, and, and he's not able to make it here. We have a, we have a chief of police and, and, and a mayor will tell you this, is that um, if, if you want to label that profiling, that does not happen in East Chicago. We don't allow it, the administration doesn't allow it, the mayor definitely doesn't allow it, and we have a chief of police now who would never tolerate anything, anything like that. Um, but it, it appears that way. It appears that we're stopping somebody or we're, or, if you guys want to call it harassment or we're questioning somebody because of their nationality or because of where they're at or because whatever reason, it's just not the case. There's laws that we have to follow as police officers. We can't just stop anybody for any reason at all. If, if for some reason that happens to you and you're stopped, for some reason you don't believe you've done anything wrong, there's nothing wrong with you guys asking questions as to why are you stopping me? Why are you questioning me? And we should be able to answer that question pretty easy. Um, if you feel like for some reason you've been targeted for a certain, for, for a reason other than what you violated or some type of crime that you violated, then um, we should know that as an administration. Um, there's, there's a process that you could, you could file a complaint on a police officer. Um, but until we know that, we, we assume that the officer is doing the right thing out there. Um, but for, for, for some of you who believe that, we're, that certain individuals, ethnic or nationality or race, whatever you want to call it, were being stopped because your pants are too low or because dreadlocks, some of the stuff that she's mentioned, it just, it's not the case. Um, but we also, as, as a law enforcement agency, we also have a responsibility to try to keep you safe. I'll give you an example, and I use this a lot with some of the guys, that if you're on the corner and you're standing there, and we know that this is a for lack of a better word, a high crime rate area, then we're probably gonna come up to you. And more often than not, it's gonna be for your safety, not for not because we're there to harass you, not because we're there to whatever, you know, or question you or interrogate you. We're there to, to probably save your life. So if you're on a the corner there and we know that there's a lot of drive-by shootings, but you're not you're not privy to that, you just hear what you hear on the street. But we know what's happening on that corner. We come up to you and we start questioning you as to why you're here and what are you doing. It's not because your pants are halfway down. We ask you to pull up your pants. It's, come on, who wants to go up around with pants like that, right? We ask you, it's not because you got dreadlocks. It's not because you're black. It's because something happened on that corner before. Something's going on or we're going to save your life because we're going to tell you to get off the corner if you have no business on there. It's just something, it's just, it's, again, you're perceiving something different. We don't, but it's not, we're not out there profiling anyone. It doesn't happen in Chicago. And if, and if it does, we uh, will handle it. Um, we failed to um, 
let you all know as panelists, we are going to ask you to limit your answers to about one minute to make sure. No, no, thank you. But yeah, I, think guys, I think you guys appreciate that. Thank you. Um, we also have a a great thank you. We also have a great panelist here with us, State Senator Ronnie Randolph. So we want to welcome him to the brother table. And actually, this next question. And Detective Beltran, thank you. This next question is for State Senator Randolph. Are there any future programs or current programs that help educate the youth about laws and their rights? <laughs> they asked me to speak one minute. I'm not sure if I can handle one minute or that. But there's all kinds of programs, not just local-wise, but regional-wise or state-wise in terms of that. The key area in terms of finding out about these programs are the neighborhood youth groups that's going on, the police department, uh, social groups like NAACP, Urban League, those kind of people are involved with active programs on a regular basis. So if you inquire and start getting involved, you'll discover there's all kinds of programs, not just for programs in terms of kids, but programs dealing with educational aspects that give you opportunity for scholarships and grants and make you become aware of different schools that's looking for students for enrollment because a lot of schools are open to down. And as a result of that, schools are starting to initiate different programs to attract people to look at their schools, like cutting back on tuition, offering grants and loans, things of that nature. So if you, if you inquire, you get involved, you ask, you're going to find out that there's programs all over the place. Matter of fact, if you go to your counselor at this school right now, you probably discover some programs you know did not exist. But all you got to do is open your mouth and ask. It's there for you. Is that one minute? <laughs> All right, our next question is for Pastor Kelly Williams. Regarding different churches and denominations, what can be done to bring us all together as one community? Well, uh, I grew up in East Chicago um, and I watched the demographics of our city change. I think when we have dialogue like this, an opportunity for us to come together and begin to try to bridge some of the gaps that we have. Um, if we all get on the same page, I think one of the big things that we've really got to work on is information and getting information out and involving everyone in the process. I think we're all trying to reach and get to the same place. I think where we have breakdowns is that we're doing it in separate ways. And if we all got on the same bus, we're headed toward the same direction. So I think basically it is learning how to communicate, get information out. And uh, I think we're all, I, I believe the police want to work with the pastors. I, I believe the politicians want to work with the pastors and the police. And I think it's through formats like this that we can come together and begin to weave um, ourselves together and begin to do some work that can bring about some credible and some real change here in Chicago. We're going to kind of switch paces right now and uh, target Mayor Anthony Copeland again. Um, who is going to benefit from all of the changes in East Chicago? Is it for the current residents or an incoming set? of population. When I look across East Chicago, when you come to reside in East Chicago, then you are an East Chicago win. So there's no divide there. Um, I, I think that everything that we do today is for the future generation. Um, I think the next leadership will come from each and every one of you in this room. I think the next police officer will be someone in this room. I think the next elected official will be someone in this room. So I think everything we do today is to prepare for tomorrow. But I, I want to piggyback back on one of the questions you asked earlier about why we don't have any um, African Americans or more Hispanics on the police department. When I became mayor, um, we were a patronage system a heavy-handed political system. We removed that out of the police department. We now have a merit system where you can test and you can compete with your peers and the cream rises to the top. So that has been removed from you. No politics is in the police department as we speak. Also, we implemented where for EC residents, 
that we give you 15% bonus points upon you successfully passing the test with a 70. I was a uh, fireman for 27 and a half years, and I can tell you there's nothing more rewarding than being a public servant. Uh, we have reached out to the churches, asked them to reach into the churches, find your best, your young, your brightest, send them our way. I, I can tell each and every one of you to be a public servant is the highest calling you will ever have in life. So our police department is beckoning for the next level of new leadership. Okay, this next question is for um, Detective Will Askew. What are some of the things you do on a daily basis to promote good work ethics and community policing? Well, the police department, uh, as, as, a, as a whole, uh, we try to uh, react to the citizens. If they come into the station and they have a, a situation or they have a problem, we try to see if we can address that uh, as quickly and uh, confident as possible. If you have a concern or anything like that, any of the entities that we have inside the police department, if it be uh, patrol, if it be detective bureau, if it be uh, gang and narcotics, uh, if you come to, uh, to the police department with those concerns, we try to address all those issues. And now, it takes time sometimes to address as many issues as we have. Police officers are at, at, at our department, but we try to, to address those situations as quick as possible. Our next question is going to be for Jada. Jada, um, this is not really much of a question. We would just like for you to share with everyone um, your story about what happened to you and um, the, the way it made you feel, how you feel today about it. Okay. I transferred from here to Morton at the beginning of senior year. And across from Morton is McDonald's. I went to the McDonald's away from my mom, and as I was walking, it was a police officer inside of a parking lot. And um, seeing him before he seen me, it was another kid that was across the street, and he was jaywalking. And when the police officer got in his car and just really spoke to him and didn't stop him for a ticket or anything, it kind of clicked in my mind then, like, okay, let me hurry up and keep walking. I didn't really think too much of it but I just kept walking. As I was walking, um, I got to the corner of the McDonald's and it was a group of kids across the street at Ward coming off from the side. And one of the kids that used to go here, he said hey to me. I waved, I said hey, and I told them not to jaywalk because I seen the police officer down the street, with, not even down the street, just a couple places down in another establishment. And as soon as the police officer pulled out, they seen him, and they all like ran across the street, like towards my way into the McDonald's parking lot to go in. And I just stayed, kept walking, because I mean, I wasn't jaywalking, so I felt no need to run with them. And another female that was in the crowd, she walked across the street slowly. She said, hey, to me. so we were starting to walk inside of the McDonald's, and the police officer pulled in and stopped us. And he told us he was going to give us a ticket for jaywalking. So he asked for our names and our addresses and stuff for the ticket. And then afterwards, me and her turned around to go inside the McDonald's because I guess we thought that was, that was it. We were just going to take our names and stuff. But then he told us to turn around. And as um, we turned around, started asking questions. And I asked him, um, how, how, how did you know I was jaywalking? You know, I, I seen you down the street. It was no way I could have been jaywalking if I just seen you down the street. You never saw me. You didn't see me, but I saw you. And he didn't say anything. And then I asked him another question. I asked him, so are we about to get a ticket? And he said, yeah. So okay. And then I asked him another question. So I asked him about if I saw him just down the street a couple minutes before like this happened, how could I have been jaywalking with the group that just literally flew by to go into McDonald's? If they didn't see you, and I, I saw you before you even saw me. 
And then from there, I guess he got mad because I was asking him questions and he couldn't really say anything. So he took out his handcuffs and he grabbed, I believe, my right arm first. Yeah, he grabbed my right arm first and then he put the cuff on my hand. And as he put the cuff on my hand with my arm, he turned, like, he tried to turn me around and he twisted my arm and then he pushed me up against the car. From that point, he was going to grab my other hand and I tried to turn around like, you know, so I could put my phone in my back pocket because I was texting my mom to tell her to hurry up. And from then, he, um, after he twisted my arm and pushed me up against the guard and I tried to turn around, it kind of went blank from there, but slowly, like over the past few months, it's really coming back. He actually hit me because I guess when I turned around, I did push, like, push him off of me because he pushed me up against the car real hard. And after that, it's kind of, it's kind of a big a little, I guess you're not even, well, I guess you can say tussle, but after, um, after he hit me in my head, somehow we were on the side of the car. He had my hair and he still had one of my, my right arm in the cup. And then I really don't know how he got me on the floor, but I was on the floor and he put his knee in my chest and I told him at least four times, like, I can't breathe, I have asthma, I can't breathe. Now, one thing, he looked down, he didn't hesitate to move or anything. Just no, no care or anything at that point. And from there, I went unconscious. And I remember thinking, right before I said the last, like, my last words on, I remember thinking, I'm not going to wake up from this. Fortunately, I did wake up. And as I woke up, he was standing on my hair. And I asked him at least three times, can you please get off my hair? Can you please get off my hair? He didn't move. He just kept my right arm with the handcuff on it. And he had my arm twisted back. Well, my, my wrist was the back. From there, from there on, he caught another squad car. From there, he caught another squad car um, to come take me into custody. And my left arm was never cuffed from, it was never cuffed, only my right arm was. But when I got up, when they pulled me up, he cuffed my other arm and put, um, put me in the other squad car. And they took me to an off-site down the street from Morton. They, um, it was an abandoned parking lot, and they had the um, fire department come see me to see if I was okay. As the man came to the car, he asked me what happened, and I was telling him, like, you know, I have asthma, and this man, He's over, he's way over 300 pounds. His, the other police officer told me, he said the man was over 300 pounds. And I'm telling him, like, you know, he just sat on my chest, I went unconscious, and all he said was, well, you look fine to me. I said, excuse me? I look fine? I said, you, you look fine to me. After that, I didn't, I didn't say anything else. I didn't even want to say anything else. And then they took me to the station, and the police officer that actually drove me, the other one, he um, took me in. He was real nice. He was talking to me, asking me what's happening, what would happen, or whatever. You know, they can't really take sides because he was not there, but you can tell that he knew something wasn't right. As I got there, um, my mom, she was, I heard them come in, and he said, your lyrics are here. I said, okay. I can hear them because the door was still open, but as they closed the door, I just waited in there. And I was in there for about a good five and a half hours. Um, they told me that the detective was supposed to come in, and from there, I could possibly go home. Uh, after a couple hours, I ran the bed, I asked him with my parents here, and one of the men told me no. I said, okay. I waited a couple minutes, even though I still knew that they were previously there. 
I waited a couple minutes, like 30 minutes or something, probably an hour. And I rang again. I said, can I call my mom? He said, no, you're a minor. The, parent, the um, phone call is made for you. I said, OK. I waited again. I rang the bell again. I said, have you talked to my mom yet? He says, uh, no, no one called her. But from there, I'm thinking in my head, why, for one, why wouldn't you call my mother? My mother hasn't seen me since this morning. She doesn't, she, well, she knows what happened, but they don't know that she really knows, but why wouldn't you call my mother? And he doesn't know that the other police officer already told me that my parents were there when he told me that they were. So at nine o'clock, they transported me to the Lake County Juvenile Center. And from there, they were booking me and stuff. And the lady, she didn't really ask me questions, but when I tried to talk to her about it, she told me she didn't want to hear it. She told me basically in her eyes that I was already guilty. Not innocent till proven guilty, but guilty. From there, she called my mom, and at that point, that's when my mom knew where I was. And she was asking me about my health because I couldn't breathe and I couldn't take I couldn't do the breathalyzer test or anything because he had just previously sat on my chest. At first, it wasn't hurting because it was you know fresh. I didn't feel anything, feel a adrenaline rush and everything. But after a while, I couldn't really breathe. I could barely speak up and talk. And Thank you, Jada. Before we continue, I would like to acknowledge that Dr. Joe, Superintendent of Schools, has joined the Table of Brotherhood. Um, but this next question is for Officer Edwards. Can you tell us how you feel about her story, and do you feel that Jada could have handled the situation differently? Her story um, is heartbreaking. The officer showed no compassion. No compassion. No compassion. But to you children, you young people, just be cordial, be respectful. That's all you have to do. Which is only three hours away. My mom called me 
before she called the police. The police was already, the police, the coroners, they were already gone before I even got there. They treated my brother as if he was a regular person on the street. They treated him like he was nothing. And the sad part about it is, nothing has still been done about it. Nothing has been done, and it's heartbreaking to know because I plan to be a police officer, I plan to work for the government, and to hear, you know, something like this is happening, you know, it's really heartbreaking and, you know, it's just, it's a dream crusher because it's like, what am I getting myself into? Is it, is it really a justice system? And, you know, I have to, you know, keep a level head with everything because this is my dream, this is what I've been saying I was gonna do since I was five years old. It is heartbreaking and at that moment, that Friday morning I would have withdrew from all my classes. I withdrew from all my classes. I said I wasn't going back to school. But my mom, she encouraged me to go back. And I fought with her, tooth and nail, because I did not want to go back. I didn't want to leave them. But I still went back for her, for my family. Lord knows I didn't want to be there. It was a point where I wasn't even going to class. Nobody seen me, nobody heard from me. Just my family. And talking to my mom and everything. Sleepless nights. Just talking, she really encouraged me, you know, to do what I needed to do, not only for my family, but for myself, because it's something I've been wanting for so long. I finished my first semester, and I finished, I finished okay, I did pretty good for the most part. I went into my second semester with a mindset that something is going to get done. And I still have this mindset about my brother. So it was easy. It was easier to handle going into my second semester because I knew if the police didn't do nothing, I was going to do something. Not nothing bad or anything like that, but I will stand up. Everybody will hear my story. Everybody's going to know my brother's name. is not going to just dwell away with everybody else. People are going to know his story. And something is going to get done. Whether I have to go to every newspaper, every TV show, everything. I'm, I would do what I have to do to bring my brother to justice. And I'm proud to say once I got that mindset, I started doing real good for myself. And I would be going into the fall semester as a junior. And for the most part of my family, we're, we're not doing to the best, but we're definitely trying. My mom tries every day to, you know, just be strong for the family, and I really commend her for that. Uh, the only thing I will say to you guys is value your family, value the person next to you, because you never know when the last time you're going to see them. You never know. And coming from this area, never let people tell you that you can't do something. Never let people tell you that you won't be something because it's sad to say people, there's people like that in this world. It's people that have hatred in their heart and we, some of us don't know why, but it's people that we try to bring you down. No matter what, don't let that bring you down. Take my story, take other people's story that are not even sitting here at this table as an example to do something. If, if you, you hear all this bad stuff, you hear all this stuff going on, but what are we really doing to stop it? What are we really doing? We can't, we can't stop somebody from pulling the trigger. We can't. That's just something we, we don't have control over.
but what are you going to do to voice your opinion and like make what your thought is matter? That's all. for Lake County Prosecutor Bernard Carter. I know that Keon mentioned that this case is unsolved. What is the process of solving this case, and how does this family receive justice in a legal standpoint? Yes, um, I'll, I'll stand up. You know, homicide cases are, are very difficult uh, to prove. And when the police department or police agency bring a case to us for review, see if they have enough evidence, Normally what we need is we need someone to come forward. Because when, when I do a trial, I have to put somebody in that uh, witness box and have them testify as to the defendant, the person who's in court, uh, committed this offense. We have to have competent evidence as to someone saw him or some scientific evidence uh, to link that individual to the offense. So what happens is many times in the communities, people don't want to come forward for various reasons. Now, one of the things that I've done in, in conjunction with uh, uh, Sheriff Bunsich, in conjunction with uh, 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 Mayor Karen Freeman Wilson, and the, your mayor has also agreed to be part of this also, is I'm moving forward with a countywide homicide unit, a very specialized unit where they do nothing but investigate homicides. They do nothing but collect intelligence. And what I mean by intelligence is that we stay in contact with the community. We stay in contact with those who can come forward and give us information that we can go to someone else and, and, and make a case. A lot of times, um, particularly in some of our more metropolitan areas, when I say Hammond, Gary, and Chicago, people don't want to get involved. They can see a crime. They can see a murder. They can see a, a shooting. They can see a robbery. And like, oh, I'm not, I'm not talking. I'm not talking. I don't trust the police. I don't trust no one. I'm not talking. Well, that case is never going to be solved. So you have to come forward. In our county here, we have 17 different city and towns. And I can tell you, I'm prosecutor over all of those in, uh, individual areas. There's a lot of communities, they come forward quickly. There's a lot of communities, they, they, they tell what's going on. They see drugs being sold next door, they're calling it to it stop. They're calling it to it stop. In the other communities, they just ignore it. In the communities that ignore it, it's hard to prove those cases. Whether it's a homicide, whether it's a robbery, whatever the case may be. And in the community where people call in and give information, it's easier for us to, to prove those cases. So really, that's the significance of it. That's what causes it. But one other point I'll, I'll make, too, is this. Now, when you talk about who's causing these, these homicides, the people who are doing these homicides, and, you know, and, and, and I can relate to this brother's testimony today. I mean, it's very moving, very moving. And I've heard too many times the exact things that he's saying happen to someone else's family and someone else's loved one. But what you all need to do and I know I did it when I, when I was in your, in your seat, and I do it with my boys, is you got to convince yourself, young ladies and young men, that you're not going to be a part of that. If everybody convinced themselves they're not going to be part of it, then we wouldn't have it. So you have to convince yourself that I'm going to do things necessary to get a good education. I'm, I'm doing things necessary to make something out of myself. I'm going to go I'm going to college, I'm going to vocational, I'm going to do a career, I'm going to start at McDonald's, whatever the case may be. You have to make it that, that you're going to do that and you're not going to participate in that. Now, with my boys, one of the rules that we have is you don't bring any babies into the house. My son's 29 years old, he went to school here. My other son is 25 years old, he just graduated from Valpo Law School. Neither one has any children. And they don't have any children because we have an agreement. They totally understand my position on that. They understand their position. They're not going to let children get in the way of them being successful. So the other agreement we have, they're not going to get married until they're 30. Now Bernie's 29, Bradley's 25, and they're both well on their way. But I am teaching them of responsibility. I'm teaching them to make something out of themselves, and I'm teaching them to make themselves right before they take on a young lady. So. If you can kind of talk to yourself and deal with yourself and your peers about making a decision on your life, anyone in here can be very successful. But it takes hard work. It takes determination. And you can do it. But as, as going back to the homicides, you know, we need people to come forward and give us information. And if you give us information, we can make a case. Thank you. We want to um, make sure that we remember that this is all about you all. So we want to give um, two students an opportunity right now to ask any question 
that's on your mind and your heart. You have your mayor, you have your state representative here, you have um, clergy, you have fellow peers. We have two opportunities for you to ask anything that's on your mind. Just come up, please. and you want to anonymously mail it to the police department, mail it to the mayor's office. But it's only when you fall silent that those who are perpetrating the crimes thrive. So again, silence is deadly. I can tell you right here, firsthand, my brother Odie Gray, he was murdered about three years ago. <laughs> I went after a person who every time I see him, they would tell me, well, I know who killed your brother. I, know. I said, well, tell me who. Here, I'm standing, me and this person together. The person would not tell me. So why would fear encapsulate you that much to where me and you one-on-one -on -one, if you felt you had information? You cannot reach the point that you are paralyzed in fear. You, you cannot. Because that's what the people who perpetrate the crimes and do things, they want us to find it as being, that's abnormal that we let those who, who prey upon us make us fall silent. That's when they thrive. So it takes courage. It takes what Keon said, the perseverance, to say, I'm not going to accept something that's abnormal and say it's normal. So all I can tell you, it takes courage. It takes courage. Um, hello, um, most of you guys know I'm Jordan 
Carlos Pino. I'm a senior. Um, my my, um, my, my uh, question is basically uh, is on the sports in, co in the community. Um, most of our um, our basketball courts were rebuilt, but what about some some other sports like maybe uh, the baseball fields being fixed and being remodeled? Not only that, like more fields for soccer and stuff. Like for example, I would, I would go to White and you'd see banners all over the city talking about uh, sports. And sports take a big toll on a city. Um, sports can teach you a lot. Sports taught me to push yourself to the best no matter what anybody says, do your best no matter what they think. And sports also can relate to the classroom and anything else in life. Sports is a big part of the city and I feel like we need a little bit more. Um, I know we don't have too many, I, I don't know if we have too many things for other stuff, I don't know what's going on in the city. I just feel like we need more more of a representation of more sports and uh, um, like more banners to get more kids involved to keep these kids off the streets because every day as I walk around, I see kids on the south side of BC um, just, you see them making gestures about shooting guns and, and, and they're, they're throwing up gang signs instead of bouncing a ball. When you see a kid uh, walking on the south side of East Chicago with a ball, um, you, it's really a surprise, you know? Because not many people see that, and you can see them playing with it shows the compassion of the sport. And um, just us rebuilding the basketball courts is a big effect. I'm not saying it's not, but it, it is a big effect. Because I'll, I'll even go, and it takes it takes not only me, but I see these little kids that that go right after school to the basketball court, and they're not they're not on the street. And these 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 young kids these young kids look up to us older kids. Yeah. And they want to be like us, and they want to mock us. But we have to show a good representation. We have to show a good representation. It's not only through sports, it's also through school. And that's what I'm saying is sports gets, can get young kids that strong mindset. Because I, I, I was raised without a father, and I looked up to most, to most people who played sports. And when I played the sports, it gave me that strong mindset to do the best at whatever you can and be the best at what you can be and and just be yourself but be a role model to the young ones because you may not notice they're watching but they're watching and and I just feel like we need more sports and more drive to, to develop this community and what we need to do in our athletics and and it will be passed down as in uh, the grades and uh, to see all, a lot of the most of these kids like doing good it makes me happy to see my friends they will they won't know it but they I feel I feel like it's awesome to see a lot of people from East Chicago um, do great. For Keon, as an example, he was a great leader when I was playing football, and I, I looked up to him as much as I can because he, he was a great example. And for him wanting to go into government and out here on this table um, showing his feelings and all that, I show him mad respect for this guy. Let me start off by addressing some of your uh, questions. I can tell you that the city of East Chicago has invested 3.3 million in your parks. Go look around in your park. We just fixed the Lady Cardinals baseball field that was in this one forever. We just fixed the baseball uh, stadium uh, at, at Block Stadium for the Cardinals team. Right here you have one of the most beautiful um, soccer fields right here at your own school. We have soccer at Tide. We have soccer at, at, at Block. We have a bitty basketball program across the whole city. Right now we got North Lake Pop Warner football where we put vouchers in place in all of our centers. We got programs all day long. But sometimes if you build it, you ask yourself, will they come? I cannot tell you that even when you, they say what, you can lean those horse to water, but you can't make them drink. At some point, you can put all these things in place, but it takes that level of parental involvement. It takes that level of we can put programs in place, after school programs. All of these things are available now. So I will simply just tell you that if you look around your community, and if you tell your parents to please get involved, that we have more things in place now than, than ever before in the history of the city. Uh, I tell people he's right. Arts and sports, you look at what we just did with the Carnegie Building. 
We just put a perform at a school of performing arts, visual and performing arts. All of these things are in place. We just put Unity Plaza in place where you can go and perform and sit in a tranquil moment and, and, and just think upon what you want to do in life. These things are coming. But at some point, you have to sit and ask your parents to get involved and to inquire and see what's going on in your city. And we have a continued loop 24-7 on, on, on our multimedia channel showing what's going on. And last but not least, you can always call the mayor office if you're in doubt. 391 and I will always lead you in the right direction. Okay, being a senior in high school, um, going off to college and graduating, um, I would like to come back to East Chicago to work, but there is like lack of jobs, so will there be jobs available when I graduate from college? I can tell you right now that um, through our economic development department, um, the city is now attracting businesses. When I first became your mayor, the city was $15 million in debt. Um, we did not have money to invest into our future. Now the budget is balanced. Now you're seeing public works projects going on. You're seeing your parks being improved. Now you're seeing a new relationship with businesses coming in here because now with the tax cap, our taxes have gone down. Businesses know they're not going to pay more than 3%. That makes a difference to where before they were being charged 7%. I mean, seven uh, dollars on, on every hundred dollars of the assessed value. Now they know they're gonna pay no more than three. Now you start to see businesses come from Illinois because their tax structure is so much higher. We're now working with Ivy Tech to develop these programs that when, when, when you two come and you want to acquire, they now know that they have to capture to get the tax credits and the tax abatements. They have to hire East Chicago residents. We're putting these things in place, but you hit the key when you, you say, when I leave and when I go prepare myself, and then when I grab that brass ring and I come back, will there be opportunity? Yes, but it'll be because you have brought something to the table. You have brought something to the table. And I can tell you that the best reward you would ever have is when you can come and bring your talent and your resources back home because that's what needed. A new infusion of new blood, new ideas, and that's the only thing that's gonna make this city thrive. You guys are gonna make uh, East Chicago thrive with what you bring back. But will there be opportunities? Yes, we have turned that corner. We are fiscally solvent. Now people see that we're open. Crime has gone down for the last four years because that's perception. So all of these things is coming together. And the only missing piece in this is you guys being willing to come back and help East Chicago be a city of hope and progress. If you become a teacher, I'll hire you. <laughs> Uh, but any, and anyway, uh, I'd like to welcome all the, uh, the people who are sitting here. Uh, the good news is the election is over. And Give a round of applause. And we know that we have a stable government for the next four or five years. And I met Mayor when I came here. We made a commitment to each other. No matter who the mayor is, we work together. You know, I'm not from here. I'm not even from America. <laughs> but having said that, I have done a lot of research. There are a lot of wealth and history here. We got to work together to make this city where it used to be. I have a lot of confidence in our kids. I, uh, high school kids know me because I visit the high school every day. You are our future. And the person who said this should not be one time out of the year, that person is absolutely right. We need to have this kind of conversation. We need to get other kids engaged. But the only way we can solve problems, if you know what the problem are, that means you tell us. We cannot do it by ourselves. As mayor says, there's another way to talk.
we know we have some problems, we have gang, we have crime everywhere, have, you help us, we help you. And I'm very, very proud to have partnership with the audience here, with all of the police department, with the mayors, with the prosecutor's office, with the senator, and as long as I'm here, I don't know how many more years I'm getting old, we're going to do our best to make this the best city ever can be. But anybody become a teacher, come back and see us. are now in competition with each other. It seems this mindset has affected the community in a negative way, now making the community vulnerable and without spiritual covering. Well, having been here 20 years, I've spent a lot of time trying to collaborate and, and uh, unify with uh, all of our churches uh, within the city of East Chicago and, and out in the surrounding areas. I think the fundamental uh, reality for East Chicago is that we have so much to offer and fail and at uh, the opportunity of maximizing our, our best potential. When, when, when you look at, and I think part of the impetus of this gathering was looking at what happened in Baltimore and looking at what happened in Ferguson. How many of you all are 18 years old? Raise your hand. All right, keep your hand up, keep your hand up, 18. If you are not a registered voter, put your hand down. All right, put your, put your hand down. How many of you all already have selected a school to go to when you graduate? Put your hand up. All right, put your hand down. How many of you all have enough money to make it to that school? Put your hand up. Scholarship, tuition paid, books, room, put your hand down. How many of you all know somebody won't make it to college this year? Raise your hand. So it's a big divide. And that divide is often left at the hand and at the doorstep of the church. I wanna, I, I wanna point something out because a lot of the questions about law enforcement, having an African American or a person of color as a prosecutor who brings culturally a sensitivity to the community that is, under his purview, predominantly white, but East Chicago and Gary and Hammond have sizable, Maryville have sizable populations of African Americans and Hispanics. He brings a different sensitivity to how he prosecutes cases. On the other end of the spectrum is understanding probable cause. And there is a profile for probable cause that's at the hand of the police officer. Jada's experience in Hammond is because Hammond has a ordinance on the book for jaywalking. And it's, and it's a law that the police department enforces. Now, the police officer uses his or her discretion on how they choose to implement and enforce that. Are you with me so far? Yes. When you don't know probable cause, like if you use profanity in the presence of a law enforcement officer in the state of Indiana, you could be arrested. Now you can say all that on, on, on the rap, you can listen to 2 Chains and, and Nicki Minaj and all of that, but if you're playing loud music in some of these municipalities, they can pull you over. Now you think that's a problem, but if you don't participate in public policy, if you got a felony and you're not a registered voter, you can't serve on a jury. So you can't help Keon out. You can't help him. If you think what's wrong happened, that happened in this family, you can't help him out if you can't get on the jury after the prosecutor brings the case. There's enough people in this room right now because what started Baltimore was a text message to high school students, Facebook and Instagram, and at the stroke of a key, thousands of young people took to the streets and now officers have been charged, six of them, but 15 were beat up. We can't have it both ways. 
You can't want the law to work for you and break the law. There's a big problem when lawmakers break the law. Because now you now now you create an imbalance. There's enough of you all in this room right now. Nobody else does anything. There's enough of you all in this room to take up Keon's family's cause and put it on Instagram and put it on Facebook that y'all want the murderer of his family member to come forth or be found out immediately. Because in all of the marches that we've done from Ferguson to Baltimore to Trayvon Martin, we now have one march in America for black on black crime to solve their nearly, listen to me, their nearly 50,000 unsolved crimes committed in black and brown communities that we don't march about. And when you see him and his mother in front of you crying, that's because they're hurting. And that's because that murderer is walking and talking and eating and sleeping in one of our neighborhoods. Each of you could take your cell phone, take your Instagram, because here's the big deal. Just like the police can't lock up all of us, the gangs can't kill all of us. Come on now. And there's more of us, there's more of us than there are of them. That's what, that, that's what happened in Baltimore. It was so many young people that the police department was overwhelmed. They just couldn't arrest everybody. And at some point, you have to have a cause bigger than you. You will never know Freddie Gray. You will never know Trayvon Martin or his family. You will never know these cases that are, that are put on national television. But Keon and his mama come from our neighborhood. They are part of us. And for us to fight for people that we've never known, never met, don't let them sit here and shed these tears and go to bed a night after night after night because what goes around comes around. And what they're going through could happen to your family. And you'll have the same question. Why didn't somebody say something? There's enough power in this room to change whatever we want to change, whenever we want to change it. All you got to do is use what you got. And together we can do it. The next question is for Councilman Quavis. What is the plan for the youth in your district? How does the council as a whole benefit the youth? Uh, good day, everybody. I know there are young folks here. I'm a little bit nervous so having such a big crowd and being one of the last to speak after so many nice things that have already been said. And I really appreciate being here and speaking with the, the youth. One of the things for myself that what I've noticed uh, that one of the key words that we need to learn as young folks and because we also were talking about our parents, simple-mindedness is something that's been lacking, I think, in our vocabulary. And because of that word not being brought out and put forth to yourselves going through high school, when I went through high school, Civil, civil class was you know, not the most popular class, but that's where it begins. Your mindset has to come in as a young person to be civil-minded. That helps you with your decisions. It helps you with your politics down the line if you choose to get involved or at least know to vote and register to vote. Those are the young things, the things that the young folks need to start honing in on. And with your social media, as, as well as you guys know that, you need to start practicing that word, civil mindedness. And that'll help your community as a whole to think civil mindedness and preach that to your parents. Because there's a lot of lack in that. The parents are not helping you as, uh, not saying use per se, but in a lot of these cases, there's a lack of parental guidance in there, and that lack in there that does not help the young folks grow in our community, especially in a community like ours that's so diverse. We need to start showing that. And for myself, as a councilman, one thing things that we can do is, is also like honing in on what the mayor had said about our, our parks, our, our, our you know, like the, the, the things that we're trying to bring back in that was programmed with Pop Warner. We have lost that. Sports is a big thing that helps people grow with their mind. It teaches them discipline. It teaches them how to make decisions. I coached for eight years in the Little League. 
And we taught every one of those children not just the fundamentals of our baseball, we taught them the fundamentals of our life. Because when you make the wrong decision to catch the ball the wrong way and you don't catch it, you're going to get upset. But that's just a, a decision you made that time. But in life, you're going to do the same. So we preached all those kind of things as growing up. And that's something that I hope that you will learn as young uh, individuals growing up into adulthood in the decision making to be civil minded and, and ask yourselves that. Go home and read it, look it up, and it'll tell you what it, what it, what it means. And uh, part of the question, I kind of mentioned some of, that, uh, some of the things that I can do and I've always done is preach that. It always help. Reach out to the police. Can you imagine if we didn't have police order in any city in this country? If people just start keep hating on what the police and what they see in right now in the media, without the police, you'd have total chaos. And it's funny, when you need the police, then they're your friend. You gotta always remind yourself that I gotta be civil-mindedly and be friendly with my neighbor, my friends, the police, and anybody that's gonna come in your path. Yeah. Well, I hope I answered your question, but as far as uh, that, you know, we are running low on time. Um, the questionnaires that were passed out to you at the beginning of the um, program, please, please make sure that you take time to fill those out before you leave and put them in the box right at that door. These questionnaires will be presented to the mayor, police department, and everyone that needs to see it will get a chance to see it. Right now, the event, we want to thank all of our panelists. Can we give a big round of applause for our panelists? We want to thank Ms. Valerie Davis. We want to thank Ms. LJ for being here with AKA and all who were a part of this wonderful event. Please make sure you turn to your questionnaires. And all seniors, please make sure you see. see